Uh, good evening, friends. A warm welcome to all of you to the today's uh, class web class on uh, chest X-ray basics. I'm Dr. Upendra Kumar, and uh, I'll be just uh, trying to cover a few things about how to read uh, chest X chest radiograph optimally. And uh, it will be at the first year level, most of it very basic level. I don't intend to go uh, to any complex level in this particular web class. Uh, so first thing that we have to understand as radiologists is instead of calling a chest X-ray, let's try and call it a chest radiograph as much as possible, technically speaking. We do make uh, uh, say many times a chest X-ray, but uh, preferably try avoid this terminology. And uh, so this looks like a pregnant lady walking, but in fact, it's uh, a lady carrying cloth to the washing machine. So what this tells us that x-rays are very similar to light and the shadows that are formed by the light are also uh, as complex as the shadows that are formed by x-rays. The only difference being uh, uh, with light we have a darker shadow and with x-rays we have a brighter shadow. So that's what we have to understand and x-rays is all about learning how to read a shadow properly. So we can make many mistakes, like, like in this particular example, where we mistook a, a, a woman uh, to a pregnant woman. And so there are a few basic ideas, few basic rules that we need to follow to interpret the radiographs properly. So coming to this x-ray, uh, so as to speak, uh, as a first year, maybe I'd call this as uh, normal. And uh, as a young radiologist, maybe I'd have even now, uh, if I was a young radiologist new to the world of radiology, maybe I'd still prefer to call this normal. We'll come back to this X-ray later. But actually, this was a case of anti-medicinal mass. So it's very important to understand a few basic rules of uh, reading chest radiographs to identify these subtle findings on the radiograph itself. So here it is. This class is about reading a chest radiograph and a very basic concept. So what we must know as radiology residents, uh, not only for the exam point of view, but also if anyone asks us opinion, so we should be able to tell them correctly, at least better than the other specialty people. So that's the idea. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit of positioning, technical aspects, and then how to review a chest radiograph systematically. As we all know, uh, the most important thing in positioning is the, the focus to film or the focus to target distance. It's actually wrong. It's, it was supposed to be the focus to film distance is somewhere between uh, somewhere 180 centimeters or 72 inches. And this, the figure on the right exactly depicts the positioning for a post anterior view of the chest radiograph. So very important is the patient has to be standing upright against the bucky. The chin should be placed above the level of the bucky like this, supported by the bucky itself, the cassette holder. And the legs should be slightly apart, correct? Both the Shoulders should be touching the the bucky, the erect bucky, and the hands. This is how they have to be they have to be positioned with the dorsum of the hands touching the hips, and this is very important so as to throw the scapula out of the field of the radiograph. So. So coming to the technical parameters, this is a very soft exposure. With the, with the onset of uh, digital radiography or CR, uh, the exposure factors don't play a major role, though we can keep adjusting the contrast. Uh, but still, if you're using manually, manual radiography, then this is very important. We don't have a second chance in that. Uh, uh, we can make out that uh, it's very difficult to identify if there is any abnormality in the mediastinum, right? They appear very bright, the soft tissues are very bright. And 
compared to this, which has adequate exposure, right? So here we can't make out most of the vertebra also in adequate, when it is, when do we call it an adequate exposure, when we are able to see the intervertebral spaces of the dorsal vertebra, at least the first four to five of them. So we should be able to see D4, D5, and D5, D6, at least to call it adequate exposure. Anything above that, if you are seeing, then it will be overexposed and nothing below that will be underexposed. So the problem with underexposure is we can miss out on the medi any mediastinal lesions, any soft opacities in the lungs, bony abnormalities, and even soft tissue abnormalities. Uh, but in a uh, overexposed or uh, high KVP X-rays, radiographs, so what uh, we generally tend to do is uh, we can identify the bony structures better. So we can identify fractures, any bony lesions, rib notching. We can also see, identify the soft opacities within the lung also, and even the mediastinal abnormalities, if any. So uh, that is the reason to do high KVP radiographs. So one more thing is how to identify whether it's a P or AP. Even the most experienced radiologists will find it very difficult in some of the radiographs, right? They almost look very alike, especially if uh, if the AP view is taken in a supine position and like in patient is not able to move. And many times, especially because of angulation, it definitely appears like a PA radiograph. But there are some rules to be followed. The one on the left is the post anterior view. The one on the right is AP view. We all know about the scapula. The scapula will be mostly seen outside the lung, uh, lungs, right, in a PA radiograph. And whereas the scapula margins can be seen overlying the lung margins uh, within the lungs. Right, they overlying the lungs. And uh, we can see the clavicles placed very high and more horizontal in an AP radiograph as compared to P radiograph. You can see a lot of uh, lungs above the level of clavicle also on P radiograph. So that, that's one another one. And we can see so the other one is the upper in cardiomegaly, which is not reliable at all. So if it is not reliable, one more thing is if it is a, a not an erect radiograph, you may not be seeing the fundal gas also. AP view, if we do it in erect, we can still see this, but if it's in supine, definitely we will not be seeing the fundal gas. And one more thing is a teacher is to teach us about this particular sign, we can see the posterior elements of the uh, upper dorsal vertebra, which looks like a person folding hands, right? The namaste sign which is generally seen in a PA view. And definitely one more thing that we can see is the inverted V appearance of the lower cervical and upper dorsal intervertebral spaces, right? Inverted V appearance. So these are seen again in a PA radiograph. And uh, even the ribs, Ribs are more horizontal in a PA view as come and more oblique in an AP view, especially see the posterior ends. The posterior ends will be down sloping in a PA radiograph, and mostly they are more horizontal on an AP radiograph. So these are very subtle things that we can try to identify. Uh, the posterior elements of the vertebral bodies are better visualized on a PA radiograph, uh, but whereas the vertebral bodies themselves are better seen on AP radiograph, though they are all subtle hints. Uh, applying them may be very difficult, so we have to follow a few of them in each radiograph to come to a correct view. Still, we may falter sometimes. So lateral radiograph, what's the use? Obviously, when we have a, a lesion like this in the lung and you want to precisely localize it's segmented days. It's better to get a lateral radiograph done. Lateral radiograph also helps in identifying small amounts of pleural effusions, right? And any posterior mediastinal, uh, locating a mediastinal mass. So, so there are many things, and this is how it has to be done. Please go through the Clarks. These images directly from the Clarks, right? 
the centering looks almost similar at the level of D6, D7. D6 to be precise, D6 is finest process, right? Uh, even the PA radiograph is very similar. So the one question that will be asked is how do we localize the D6 finest process uh, when centering for our radiograph, just radiograph? So it's simple, the lower margin of the the inferior angles of the scapula are at the level of T7 vertebral body transverse process. So you can just palpate the inferior angles and, and come to that the center, the whatever the spinous process you're going to feel just above is going to be D6. So that, that way it helps. So in this particular look, uh, the lesion that we saw on the right, in the right lung on a lateral radiograph is located somewhere into the uh, anterior segment of the lower lobe, right lower lobe. So it's very important on lateral radiograph to understand the structures, especially if it is related to the hyla, to give us subtle hints about the abnormalities. As we all know, the left pulmonary artery passes above the level of bronchus. So any vessel seen, uh, this is the uh, main bronchus, any vessel seen above it, curving above it, will be a left side of left pulmonary artery. Anything in inferior or in front of the bronchi will be the right pulmonary artery. So just identify this and there is a clear window below the level of the right pulmonary artery which should be a loosened zone, right? If even that is occupied then start suspecting hyalolympharinopathy or a mediastinal abnormality. Again, lateral radiograph chest and a few subtle hints that can be used to identify abnormalities. Look at the borders, the anterior border of the heart was formed by the right ventricle. And the posterior most margin of the heart is formed by the left atrium. And just in front, you can see the vertical IVC entering the right atrium. As we go from above downwards along the vertebral column, the, it, there should be an increasing lucency downwards. Okay, if there is any opacity in this, we can definitely identify easily. Trachea. So now we discussed about. Uh, positioning, we discussed about exposure factors. One more thing that we didn't discuss was about centering. Uh, it's easy to look at the centering part. Just, uh, the, just measure the distance between a vertical line drawn along the spinous process and the medial ends of both clavicles. So the distance on either side should be the same to call it a well-centered term. And if it is increased on one side, then the patient was probably rotated to that particular side when the radiograph was taken. So if the distance is increased on the right side, then the patient was rotated towards his right when the radiograph was taken. That means there will be an increasing lucency of the right lung it's because there is an air gap between the patient and the cassette on the right side, whereas the left will almost be touching the radiograph. Sorry, the cassette. So increasing increased lucency due to ipsilateral rotation. That's one of the causes for unilateral translucency. One more thing, and when there, it's not adequately centered, better don't comment on the cardiac size or even the hilar size because one hilar, particular hilar will appear more prominent than the other. And more many times, even the cardia may be abnormally enlarged or abnormally small. And maybe many times in the right cardiac bottom may not be well visualized, if it's, especially if it's rotation towards left. So better don't comment on the cardiac size in a rotated films. And even some lesions may be masked because of overlap with the mediastinum if there is cross rotation. One more thing that we have to see is about inspiration, adequate inspiration or expiration. So most of the times we end up taking in our routine practice in a deep arrested inspiration, the radiograph, right? So that we can see maximum portion of the lungs. So that is very important. Uh, so for that to happen, to call it an adequately, adequate inspiratory effort, what we need to see is the anterior ends of the first six ribs should be seen above the level of the diaphragms, 
within the lungs, right? They should be overlying the lungs. But in Indian setting, at least anti-rents of pyrus should be seen above the level of hemidiaphragms. Similarly, the posterior ends of 10 or in Indian setting, nine ribs should be seen above the level of hemidiaphragms. Call it adequate inspiration. If it's not adequate inspiration, again, we may be missing some lesions, especially in the base of the lung. We may be mistakenly calling it a cardiomegaly. You may be missing pearl effusions, right? We may be wrongly diagnosing basal consolidations because of vascular congestion if it's not adequately uh, taken up an adequate inspiration. So these are the factors that we need to see before we actually go on to report a test radiograph. And uh, we follow a certain pattern. And uh, I would prefer this. You can follow your own, but ensure that you have a, a, a list of things that you have to report by your side, at least in the first 100 radiographs that you're going to read. And make it a habit to read it in the same order. So it's like a checklist. So what I was taught and I'm comfortable will be this. Trachea, the first thing that I always believe uh, uh, we have to see is trachea. So trachea will not only tell about the position of a radiograph, it, it also makes you comfortable telling that, okay, there is uh, something normal there. So it helps in identifying uh, any upper abnormalities in the mediastinum. So the position of trachea is mostly to the, slightly to the right of the center or the center itself. And the dimensions are given here, a normal diameter is 25 millimeters on a P or AP radiograph and female it's 21. And I think more than that is abnormal. And paratracheal stripes, uh, that is, a, this line that is seen along the right border of the trachea is called the right paratracheal stripe. And that should never be more than four, uh, five millimeters. And the left paratracheal stripe, actually there is a controversy on the left paratracheal stripe. Stripe basically refers to a layer of tissue between two air columns. Okay, so that's the stripe. It's the tracheal air column and the lung and the tracheal wall is in between, so that forms the right paratracheal stripe. But on the left side, there are much more than the tracheal wall, so there is a controversy whether to call it as a left paratracheal stripe at all. Many people, the old timers, prefer not calling it as left paratracheal stripe. However, books still have mentioned that this should be less than 10 millimeters. And definitely there is an angle that is formed between the true bronchi, it's called the carinal angle, and uh, it should be definitely between around 60 to 80 degrees, it's 60 to 85 degrees, right? Anything above 90 again will be widened carina. So once we have seen the diameter, the position of the trachea, look for if there is any displacement. Like in this case, there is a left wide out lung, the trachea is deviated to the opposite side. That means something is pushing from the left. So there must be a huge pleural effusion, a huge mass, right? Or pleural effusion with consolidation. So there are many possibilities. In this case, there is again a wide out lung, but there is ipsilateral deviation of trachea to the right side. In this case, the trachea is being pulled to this ipsilateral side. You can also see that the, the cardia is not at all seen. So it's even that is pushed, pulled towards the right side. So that means there is a collapse of the right lung. Tracheal narrowing. So as I said, there's an entity called tracheal narrowing very carefully, especially in infections. Uh, children, this is also called the steeple sign in a croup, wearing the tracheal bronchitis. And endotracheal masses can be obliterating the lumen. Even foreign bodies can be narrowing the tracheal lumen. Widening of trachea. Anything about 25 millimeters, it's called widening. It's seen in tracheobronchomalacia. There is some also congenital tracheobronchomagaly called monier cone syndrome. Then paratracheal stripe we discussed, right? 
up to four millimeters is normal, above five is up, five and above is abnormal. In this case, it is widened. It can happen most commonly in lymph node enlargement. But it can also happen in uh, subtle pleural effusions and tracheal masses. So next, after the trachea, I would like to see the hilum, the hilar shadows. Obviously, the first thing that we have to understand the chest radiograph is what forms the hilum. So, first we need to know is what are the markings that are seen within the lung. So, air doesn't cause any bright shadow, right? Is air will cause a lucent shadow, lucency, not even a shadow. Air will cause a lucency on the radiograph because it allows the X-rays to pass through. However, structures like connective tissue vessels will cast a bright linear shadows in the lung, right, in the lungs. So whatever things that we are seeing, mostly are vascular markings. Similarly, what we have to understand is, on, an, on a radiograph, the hyla are formed by vessels, purely vessels, okay? And anything medial to the, uh, some lucency that we see here, the, this is the bronchus, the bronchus intermedius. But the hilar shadow is, this is the hilar shadow that we consider it to be. And that is formed by vessels. So on a radiograph, pulmonary hyla is formed by vascular markings. The upper part of the concavity is formed by superior pulmonary vein. And our lower part is formed by the descending of the inferior pulmonary arteries. Remember this, this is very important and they form a concave angle laterally. So when it comes to hilum, what we need to understand, similarly on the left side, the upper one is formed by the superior pulmonary vein, and the lower one is formed by the inferior pulmonary artery, and it's concave laterally. And one more thing is, in hyla, we have to comment on the position of the hyla, the size, and the density. Coming to the position, the left hilum is, in 97% of the cases, higher than the right hilum. And in 3%, they can be of the same level. Left hilum normally is never below the level of right hilum. So why is it so? As I said, the hyla on a radiograph is formed by vessels. So the left pulmonary artery, which goes above the level of the left main bronchus, makes the left hilum appear higher than the right hilum where the right pulmonary artery actually goes, doesn't go above the level of the bronchus, okay? So that's the reason. So that's the position and usually most, so, Yeah, uh, what we need to understand is usually the right hilum is at the level of the uh, sixth or the seventh intercostal space, mostly on the seventh posterior intercostal space, and the a left one will be one level higher, posterior intercostal space I'm talking about, if it is a well-centered and uh, if the positioning is correct. And regarding density, increased density of the hyla lymph nodes when come in comparison with the opposite uh, hyla, you can refer to either calcific, calcified lymph nodes or enlarged pulmonary artery, okay? The third one, that, uh, sorry, the another factor that we have to comment is the size of the hyla. The size of the hyla, and the only way uh, that has been described is measuring the hyla, the transverse diameter, uh, one centimeter below and lateral to the hilar angle. Okay, so one centimeter, this is the hilar angle here, so one centimeter below and lateral will be somewhere here. Measure this, and this has to be within 15 or 16 millimeters. And if it is enlarged, then it indicates enlarged pulmonary arteries. As I said, the shape of the hyla has to be concave laterally. If it's lobulated or there is loss of this concavity, think in terms of enlarged pulmonary artery. If it's lobulated, then think of hyla enlarged lymph nodes. So this is about hyla. So again, hyla enlargement. Lobulated means think about lymph nodes. So there's a paratracheal 
lymphadenopathy and bilateral hilar lymphadenopathy and all these three most commonly together seen in sarcoidosis. So one more thing, now this is another radiograph of the chest where we see a mass lesion here, uh, very ill-defined margins, speculated appearance on the lateral margins, right? Obscuring the cardiac border. And even we can't make out the hyla properly. So it becomes complicated. So we know it's a mass lesion. And these speculations, remember, if the lateral speculations like this indicate that the mass is infiltrating the lung from the hyla. So it's a hilar mass, or uh, it's a hilar mass, it's infiltrating into the lung. Or what else can it be? Basically, a hilar mass or a central mass, if we may call so, if uh, we are talking about a bronchial, uh, bronchial mass infiltrating into the lung. And this appearance most commonly we see in a squamous cell carcinoma or any central malignancy. Okay, so this is important. The speculations on the lateral margins indicate the mass is likely to be malignant. So here we come to another interesting case. There is again a mass here, very smoothly margined. Correct. And what we are seeing here is we're not. Are we able to see the right heart border clearly? No. And we are seeing some vessels actually uh, overrunning the mass shadow, correct? There is no clear cut di uh, di differentiation between the right cardiac margin and the mass. And the vessels are also seen coursing overlying the mass shadow. So what does this mean? So there's an entity called hilum overlay sign. Felson originally described the hilum overlay sign as being uh, a sign which can differentiate cardiomegaly from amediastinal mass. The concept is if there is a cardiomegaly, there is always a lucency of up to one centimeter between the right cardiac margin and the hilum, hilar shadow. Okay, so the, if there is a lucency between the hilum and the cardiac margin of up to one centimeter or lesser, it means it's a cardiomegaly. If there is the lucency is lost, like in this case, there is no lucency. That means it's a mediastinal mass. So Felsen originally described hilum overlay sign to differentiate cardiomegaly versus mediastinal mass. That's what I want to say. However, the secondary implications of hilum overlay came to be that if we can see some vessels coursing through the mass itself, the mass is unlikely arising from the vessels of the hyla. And so the mass is either anterior or posterior to the hyla. So this is the secondary implication. If there was a clear cut lucency between the hyla and the mass, then it the mass was likely a cardiomegaly rather than a mediastinal mass. Okay, that was the original concept. And if the vessels are not seen coursing through the mass, okay, then it's more likely to be a enlarged pulmonary artery and again a cardiomegaly. So, hilum overlay sign has two implications. And we need to understand that. So this is another case in which we can see again vessels coursing through this particular mass and there is no lucency in between, correct? And again, uh, this is a hilum overlay sign to, uh, telling that this is a mediastinal mass. There is another sign called hilum convergence sign. So what is this? Uh, let's try to understand. Okay, we know there is a mass here right and uh, which is obscuring the right heart border it's a mediastinal mass it's obscuring the right heart border and the lateral aspect of this particular mass we can see vessels which are almost parallel to each other at the lateral margins so when they are parallel to each other then the mass is unlikely to be arising from 
the vessels okay it's not vascular pathology okay it's not a hilar lesion so that's what it means if they are converging at the lateral margin instead of being parallel then it is a hilar lesion so that's what hilar hilar convergence means so in this particular case we can apply both the signs one is hilum overlay and hilum convergence so how to apply hilum overlay sign first of all the original felsen's law suggested we can see the hyla and there is no lucency between the heart and the hyla so this is a mediastinal mass and the secondary implication of hilum overlay sign that i was talking about see the vessels coursing through the mass itself so the mass being a mediastinal mass is not arising from the hyla either it's anterior to the hilar vessels or posterior to it most commonly it is anterior and now apply the hilum convergence for confirmation so the vessels are parallel at the lateral margin of the mass that again indicates the mass is not from the hyla it's as simple as that and whenever you come across a mass like this it's mostly anterior mediastinal in this particular case if you can see the right heart margin is also obscured and the felsen's suggests i mean the felsen's classification of mediastinum includes the heart in the anterior mediastinum so any obscuration of margin of the heart means the mass is in the anterior mediastinum that we can see in the ct scan here so once we are done with the hyla the hilum overlay and the hilum convergence signs let's try to understand what are the other structures in the mediastinal cell out so on the left side it starts with the aortic arch above it will be the left subclavian artery not so well seen in this but definitely the aortic arch the pulmonary artery the left atrial appendage the left ventricle forms the left mediastinal cell out the right mediastinal cell out is formed by the right atrium correct the azygous arch right atrium and above will be a superior vena cava part of the azygous arch and the brachiocephalic vein above this level what we need to understand is the right ventricle does not form part of either the right or the left mediastinal cell out but definitely does form part of the inferior margin this is not well made out on a p or ap radiograph and right ventricle definitely is a anterior forms the anterior margin on the lateral radiograph so this is what is important to know again just to recap how to differentiate whether it's a pulmonary artery or left atrial appendage just trace the left main bronchus left main bronchus any opacity any concavity or convexity about this level indicates pulmonary artery and any anything just below the bronchus the left main bronchus will be left atrial appendage shadow okay so this is the pulmonary bay usually it should be concave so this this depicts very nicely the inferior vena cava the right atrium the superior vena cava and the brachiocephalic vein how to measure the cardiac size the cardiac thoracic ratio so it's very important to know this draw in a well it's only to be done in a well center radiograph otherwise don't do it so well center radiograph draw a perpendicular line the uh, vertical line along the spinous process of the vertebra right in the center and on either side draw horizontal lines to the longest right and the left dimensions of the heart and add these two and again for a thoracic diameter it should be the uh, maximum inner diameter of the thoracic cavity so how do we do it the inner diameter meaning the inner margin of the ribs wherever we get the maximum diameter horizontal diameter that has to be taken uh, it may vary in different patients some textbooks mention at the level of dome of diaphragm and all and uh, Dome of diaphragm falsely gives measuring at that level falsely gives to many cardiomegalies, and uh, this is the best, the maximum innermost thoracic diameter. Mostly, it will be at the level of CP angles. So anything, the ratio should be less than 50% in a well-centered PA radiograph. On an AP radiograph, you can take up to 60% to be normal because of apparent cardiomegaly. So the cardiomegaly. To suggest it's not just enough to call cardiomegaly just by saying it is 
more than 50% CT ratio. Comment on what is the abnormality, like if the apex is touching the diaphragm, call it a left ventricular enlargement. If there is a clear cut uh, lucency between the diaphragm and the apex, it's right ventricular enlargement. If there is a double shadow on the right heart border, it's a left atrial bar, right atrial enlargement. So we have to be more specific on what is the chamber, likely chamber that is enlarged better. And then the hemidiaphragms. When, when it comes to the hemidiaphragms, we should comment on the position. The right hemidiaphragm is 97% uh, either the right hemidiaphragm is at the higher level or both the hemidiaphragms at the same level in 97% of normal individuals. In 3% of the cases only, the left hemidiaphragm may be higher than the right. And how much higher? The right hemidiaphragm is usually three centimeters above the level of the left hemidiaphragm, the dome I am talking about. And uh, or one intercostal space, three centimeter or one intercostal space. So, why is it so? Um, many people would suggest that the liver will be pushing up the right hemidiaphragm so it will be higher. But that's not the reason. Uh, it's difficult for a structure to push something against the gravity. Okay, so it's because the right, uh, the heart which is pushing the left hemidiaphragm down, the left hemidiaphragm is lower. So that that's about position of the diaphragm. Then coming to the contour, it should be uniformly convex above upwards, right? So that is very important. And some variations are there, like seen here, right? There is a hump which is more medial, if this one is more lateral, then start suspecting a pathology, it should be more medial, then it's fine, it's a focal eventration and a normal variant. There can be scalloping like this, splits, which are also forms of minor eventrations. So position and shape, contour, are two important things that to be commented when it comes to the hemidiaphragms. One more thing we can see always is the fundocupolic distance on the left side, this is the thickness of the tissue between the fundal air bubble and the uppermost part of the diaphragm. Usually it should be less than uh, six millimeters. Six, eight, yeah. uh, less than seven millimeters in fact. So elevation of diaphragm can occur due to many reasons. Like in this case, there's an upper lobe collapse because of a hilar mass, which is also called the reverse goldenness or the golden, just the goldenness sign. And we can see the right hemidiaphragm is elevated and there is some tenting here, which is called dextra P. So the upper lobe collapse can cause elevated hemidiaphragm. The lower lobe collapse can also cause elevated hemidiaphragm. Pneumonectomy can cause elevated hemidiaphragm. Correct. On the right side, uh, possibly there was pneumonectomy, though we can see multiple fractures on the left. And uh, eventration can cause elevated hemidiaphragm. And when it's eventration, there is always a mediastinal shift to the opposite side. Eventration is thinning, thinning of the diaphragm due to structural abnormality. And most of the times it's on the left side and it's associated with reduced or no diaphragmatic movements that we can assess some fluoroscopy or ultrasound, and definitely there is a mediastinal shift. Diaphragmatic paralysis will have no or paradoxical movements and usually does not have much of mediastinal shift. And we can do a sniff test where we can try to see the paradoxical movements. And then next, we have uh, this particular data graph where we can see uh, an abnormality here, which is causing an obtuse angle with the lung. So it's a mediastinal abnormality. In this case, you can also see the margin going beyond the in, uh, level of the hemidiaphragm inferior to it with some air lucencies within. This is a uh, diaphragmatic hernia. And next, we have to see the CP angles. The right CP angle, they, they have to be very sharp, like we can see on the left side. They have to be very sharp. And anything that is blunted or tracking along the lateral chest wall indicates pleural effusion or pleural thickening. So, an emphysema, the pleural, they'll be blunting. 
even the uh, even the diaphragm will be flattened in emphysema. The contour will be uh, not uh, convex. So this is emphysema again. So blunting and there's some pleural effusion also in this. Cracking along the lateral chest wall, flattening of the diaphragm. One more thing about CP angles is look for this, especially in a supine radiograph in an emergency. If you can see a very long uh, CP angle, then it starts suspecting pneumothorax, right? So this is very important, deep sulcus sign. So finally, when we come to assess the lungs, always compare both sides of the lungs as zones. The upper zone is anything, uh, draw a horizontal line at the lower part of anterior end of the ribs, second ribs, right? And, and a lung uh, above the level of this particular uh, line will be the upper zone. Between the anterior ends of second and the fourth ribs, the horizontal lines will be the middle zone and anything below it will be the lower zone. But I personally feel we should start uh, writing our reports in possible segments, lobes at least, instead of zones. Zones and lobes don't match obviously. So we should be more, we can be more specific on the radiograph itself as a radiologist. Definitely it may be a helpful for other specialties, but as radiologists, we better stick to anatomical terminologies like this. So this gives the upper lobe and the right middle lobe segments uh, orientation. We can see so any lesion here will be the anterior segment of the upper lobe. This is posterior segment. And this also depicts the sill out. Sill out on a radiograph means actually loss of uh, definition of the margin. Uh, the dictionary meaning tells sill out means margins. In just in a radiograph, sill out sign is positive and the margin definition is lost. So when the upper part of the mediastinum definition is lost, so the lesion is more likely, there is a lesion more likely in the apical segments. Similarly, the right cardiac margin, it will be the medial segment of the middle lobe or the middle lobe itself. And if there is loss of definition or sill out sign positive for both hemidiaphragm and the heart, it is more likely to be in the medial basal segment of the lower lobe. Similarly, in the left cardiac margins, the lower part will be lingular segments, the upper part will of the mediastinum on the left will be the anterior and the apical posterior segments. So the basal segments also show sill out sign with the hemidiaphragm. So sill out sign is very important to know. And this is a radiograph. It's a case of congenital lower emphysema. For a beginner, it may be difficult to interpret. So it's very easy. Check the lungs, upper zone wise, compare both sides, okay? Place a hand or something, the rest of the lungs and just uh, compare both sides. If they are equal, then it's normal. In this case, that it's more loosened in the middle zone on the left side. So this was a case of congenital lobar emphysema. So what is there in this? Uh, actually, it was a very difficult X-ray. So the importance is after the lungs also try and see the soft tissues and the bones. The soft tissues, we have to see the breast shadows in, in ladies, especially axillary folds, the infradiaphragmatic area, the supraclavicular fossa, the axilla, right? So in this case, there is an absent breast shadow on the left side, very subtle hypertransplacency of the left lung. This is a case of mastectomy. So again, uh, this is just uh, an example of uh, overinflation or a unilateral hypertransplacency of the lung. Uh, so this is very important to know. I'll just rush through the last few slides. Look at this particular line, especially in case of emergencies. If this line should be opaque, not loosened. It should be opaque like this. I know vascular markings should be seen lateral to it then it's pneumothorax, okay? Many times you can see fluid levels at the bottom, but initial phases, there may not be any fluid levels. Look for this. So it's an opaque line, not a lucent line, and it should be within the lungs, right? If it is going beyond the lungs into the soft tissue, it may, may be a, just a skin fold. Be care, very careful about it. There are some causes for unilateral hypertranslucency, most common being rotation, followed by pneumothorax, mastectomy, Poland syndrome, many others. 
So what is this? So this is uh, just to measure uh, emphysema and all. Uh, so the flattening of diaphragm that I was talking about, just if you draw a line from the costophrenic to cardiophrenic angle and measure the dome, it should be, usually it is around 2.5 to 3 centimeters. Anything less than 1.5 centimeters is of norm. So emphysema, we have uh, flattening of diaphragms and uh, blunting of CP angles. And what are the different lung abnormalities? So to standardize what are the abnormalities that can happen in the lungs, we have to use particular terminologies, like this is a consolidation where we can see a bronchogram, very ill-defined opacity. So they can be in the in within one lobe, like in this, it's mostly upper lobe and middle lobe combination. And uh, then it becomes a lobar pneumonia. They can be bronchopneumonia, which is bilateral, patchy, multiple consolidations. In this case, it is uh, atelectasis of the middle lobe with still out sign positive with the right cardiac margin. We have multiple masses and nodules of different sizes, mass anything more than three centimeters in size, well-defined and round to oval, all round surrounded by lungs, then we call it a nodule or a mass depending on the size, more than three centimeters it's a mass, less than three centimeters it's a nodule. And anything very, very, I mean like two to four millimeters we call miliary nodules. Uh, so that is what it is. Let's use the standard terminologies depending on the condition. And again, uh, when we talk about interstitial lung diseases and all, uh, opacity should be ideally called either as reticular, or reticular nodular, or nodular. So these are the three terms. Better use these three terms as often as possible. Most often, they will be reticular nodular. So both reticular and nodular opacities, which depict that there is interstitial thickening. There is an interlobular septal thickening, the counterpart on CT scan, right? So use the terms reticular, reticular nodular, and nodular. Uh, and a uh, few other terms that we can be used is plate atelectasis, linear bands. So, so that is how uh, uh, we need to identify. Yeah, one more thing about lungs is uh, many times we come across this. Pulmonary vasculature, whether it is normal, increased, or reduced pulmonary vasculature, usually is seen. The vessel should be seen in the medial two thirds normally and not seen in the lateral one third. If they are also seen on the lateral one third of the lungs, both sides, then it is increased vascularity. If it is seen only in the medial one third, even the middle and the lateral one third, they are not seen. It is oligemia. But whenever there is increased pulmonary vascularity, better do a lateral radiograph to just confirm. And we, we, the retrosternal space, that lucency, will not be seen clearly if there is increased pulmonary vascularity indicating a dilated pulmonary artery. So, pleural masses, so how to identify? Broad base towards the pleura, and the, sorry, the chest wall, and sheet like opacities, calcifications indicate pleural plaques and all. Coming back to still out sign, still out is loss of definition of margins. So for, for sell out sign to be positive, three conditions are required. The opacity and the structure that it is sell outing should be in the same plane and they should be of the same density and they should be touching each other. So if either of these is not there, then there won't be any sell out sign. In this case, opacity is sell outing the left heart border, which indicates the, leash, the opacities in the lingular segments. Okay, so this is the same case. And in this case, though, there is an opacity which is not slotting the uh, cardiac border. That means it's not in the plane of the heart. And so it was in the posterior basal segment. So again, just to tell you what are the uh, structures adjoining the mediastinum to uh, use the slot sign. So there are some hidden areas of the lung that can have to be very carefully seen. When the radiograph appears normal like this, look at something behind the heart, the apices, right? Below the level of diaphragms, at the hyla, right? See, these are the few things that, if you see carefully, there is some lesion here, infradiaphragmatic, below the right hemidiaphragm. So on CT, it was confirmed within the lung. So there was some speculated mass in the posterior basal segment. So be careful, so these are the, Hidden areas when the X-ray appears, a radiograph appears normal, try to see at these areas. So this is how we can do an apical view to look at the apical opacities or apical pleural thickening very carefully. 
oral angulation of 30 degrees or cranial angulation of 30 degrees if it is a APM, a pical view. So again, importance of soft tissues. Soft tissue we need to see, uh, like in this case, there is some emphysema, soft tissue, neurofibromatosis, we can see multiple nodular opacities. You can see another soft tissue opacity, like here in the neck, most probably a thyroid, retrosternal. And most importantly, again, uh, not to miss of soft tissues, also look at the bones, some bony fractures here, uh, uh, basically cervical ribs, some bony lesions, density of the bones of normal, and rib notchings. These are the things that we have to try and see before we can uh, complete our report. There are a few more signs to be talked about, the cervical thoracic sign. Any lesion, mediastinal lesion, with the lateral margin going above the level of clavicles, and just clear, the lateral margin should be clearly seen, sharply defined, even above the level of clavicles is likely to be in the posterior mediastinum, because anterior mediastinum stops at the level of clavicles, below the level of clavicles, okay? So whatever it is, it, either it's in the posterior mediastinum or it can be at the level of skin also, which easily the outside air may be lining it. So there has to be some air lining the mass. So when this is the posterior mediastinal mass is the more probable thing. Thoracic abdominal sign is also very similar. Lesion going below the level of hemidiaphragms and very clearly defined margins is likely to be in the posterior mediastinum or the posterior part of the hemithorax. Summary. So while reading a test radiograph, follow this pattern, take a clinical history because many times the similar pattern of x-rays appear in different conditions. White out lung, there are many possibilities. Unilateral hypertransplacency, many possibilities. History is very important. Identify the patient's side. Side is very important. Right, left, many times. You can mistake it for an extracardia, and extra position, side is inverses. So just a correct identification marker will help you out. A P and versus AP exposure factors, look for rotation, centering, inspiration. We can follow these uh, uh, checklists to complete the reporting of chest radiograph. And I complete with this. Thank you all for joining the, this session. And uh, definitely, any of your feedback is most welcome. You can ask your questions personally to my WhatsApp number.